All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for our campus history program about the Do and Dare exhibit. We're very excited to be able to share more about this program. Um, this, um, sorry, just uh, there's some background noise, but um, so I'm gonna keep going. Hello, everyone, my name is Allison Hughes and I'm the program coordinator for the Friends of the Libraries at NC State. I'm so glad you've joined us for our event today. The libraries and its partners are working to ensure that our programs are welcoming and affirming for everyone involved. That means that everyone from event attendees has an important role to play in contributing to a respectful and positive environment. That's why we ask you to reflect on the way you pose comments and questions in the chat to ensure that they do not harm other participants. When we speak, the impact of our words is just as important as our intent. Today, we ask that you engage in this program with exploration and curiosity while being kind and intentional with your words for the sake of our community. During the presentation, we ask that you remain muted. If you have any questions or mem memories you'd like to share, please place them in the chat and we'll collect them for a question and answer session after the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Carson, Friends of the Libraries board member, to talk about the Friends of the Libraries. Thanks, Allison. Welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Carson. I'm a member of the Friends of the Library Board of Directors at the North Carolina State University Libraries. And on behalf of the Friends, I'd like to welcome you to today's program. If you're interested in engaging with our awesome libraries, I encourage you to consider becoming a friend. We host a variety of events and programs throughout the year. We raise funds for student support on campus and many other activities. To learn more about Friends of the Library, please follow the link we're sharing in the chat below. I hope you enjoy today's program. Thank you, Chris. And now to introduce Andrea from the Alumni Association. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Sellers, and I am pleased to be joining you as your representative from NC State's Office of Alumni Engagement and Annual Giving. I want to take a moment to thank you all for joining us and give a special thank you to members of the NC State Alumni Association and any um, donors or friends and supporters of NC State University. We love doing programs like this and we could not do so without all of your support. So thank you. Now to introduce our presenters for this program, Kelly Arnold, Henry Stover, and Virginia Ferris. Kelly Arnold is currently a master's student in the public history program at NC State. She works for the library's exhibits team with a focus on research and writing. Prior to joining the Wolfpack, Kelly received two bachelor's degrees in history and anthropology from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and looks forward to working in historic sites and museums after graduating. Henry Stover is a senior in art and design who has followed in his mom, mom's footsteps by coming to NC State. He has been working as an exhibit design and production assistant with the library since his freshman year, where he began working on the Technician 100 exhibit. He loves working in the library because it allows him to build connections within the NC State community and gives him opportunities to develop his skills as a designer. Gender has been a complicated subject for Henry as a queer person, but he is excited to celebrate the extraordinary compliment accomplishments of women on campus with this exhibit. And Virginia Ferris has worked in NC State University Library Special Collections Research Center since 2014 where she currently oversees outreach and teaching with the university's archives and special collections as lead librarian for outreach and engagement. She focuses in particular on empowering students and other researchers to examine historical gaps and silences in archives and on finding ways to integrate and repair them today. Ferris holds an MS in library science from UNC Chapel Hill, an MA in Irish studies from the New York University and a BA in anthropology from Bernard College. I'd like to, to pass the torch now to, to Kelly, Henry, and Virginia. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, so I'll be the first one that kind of starts talking about um, the exhibit. Um, I'm Kelly, uh, so I'm the graduate researcher um, and I did a lot of the writing for the exhibit. 
So I'm going to kind of give an overview of like why we chose to do this exhibit now, what were kind of some of our guiding concerns, and then what are the main themes that you guys will get to see um, in the exhibit. It's really big and covers a lot of women, so I might not hit on every single person who's featured, so I really encourage you guys to actually go and see the exhibit um, in person if you have the time over at DHL Junior Library. Um, so first off with the title, Dare and Do Women's History at NC State, um, the dare and do part is actually a quote from Gertrude Cox, who was one of our women's first that are featured in this exhibit. Um, she was one of the first female um, uh, department heads for the Department of Statistics, and that speech was from women who dare and do recent advancements in statistics given to Delta Kappa Gamma, which is a professional society of women educators. Um, so I, when I came across that quote and that title, I was like, wow, this is a perfect title for the exhibit. I kind of knew like right there and then in the archive that that was why I wanted this exhibit to be called. And luckily the team agreed with me that it was a good one. Plus it fits in with the think and do um, motto. Um, so why this and why now? Um, so the anniversary of Lucille Thompson being the first full-time female student enrolled um, was in 2021. And then we also co are coinciding with the 30th anniversary of the Women's Center. They did a really awesome exhibit in the visualization studio um, last semester. And I, that kind of really informed working with them and like seeing that exhibit really also helped to inform um, our thought process on this exhibit as well. Um, even though we don't we ha don't have the opportunity to get as in depth on them, but that's kind of the reason why this exhibit is coming when it does. And then, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the archival research process since that was the majority of what I did for this exhibit. Um, so what you see on the slide kind of behind the title is my giant master document um, that I made when I first started this position um, back at the beginning of last semester. So basically I went through and I kind of call my way that I do my research as like the major collection method where I'll have like hundreds of tabs open so that I can find every single thing that possibly relates to whatever I'm researching. And then I go through and narrow those down. So this um, table was really my lifeline in terms of trying to figure out um, what were major, who were major women, what were major events, um, and then what could we actually put into the exhibit. So you can kind of see I would have the name or the event um, that would include um, people's names like Kathy Sterling that you see here or the first women's dorm. Um, these are not listed in any particular like date order, um, but I would kind of put them into potential categories that ended up kind of being refined into the exhibit uh, that you see now. So like this is a really big topic. Um, the school opened in the 1890s, and you can see this up here. The Board of De Bleh, the Board of Trustees' decision to allow women in actually happened in 1899, um, even though the first female student didn't enroll until 1901, um, and that was Margaret Burke, who was the first one to do it. So there's been a really, really long history of um, women being at NC State. And then before there were even female students, there were always female staff and faculty, or female staff that were on, um, that were part of NC State's campus and really shaped it. Um, other major changes that I really wanted to highlight um, were the first time that women were allowed to um, live on campus, which was the opening of the first women's dorm in 1964, because I think that that's a major change. Prior to that, women couldn't live on campus, so they had to live um, with friends. They had to find somewhere to stay off campus. There was even like one story of a girl living with a professor's family because she's family friends with them. Um, and she was like, yeah, I quickly learned to like not tell people that I was like living with a professor, which was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I think that um, that dorm, which uh, opening was like really important for uh, this community of women to start being built at NC State. Um, and then the other, of course, is the Women's Center created in 1991. I think that that was, again, another point for women to be able to have a central place to go to and connect with other people. Um, so I really wanted to recognize that as another like major milestone. Um, so a lot of this information I gathered from meetings with libraries and archival staff, um, the special collections timeline, the women's history timeline was like my another one of my lifelines because they have done so much work to try to put in a lot of the major firsts. Um, and then I also 
went through special collections finding aids. I did look through digitized photos, wolf tales, university news, and then also worked with the Women's Center staff. So at the end of this giant table being built, there were 172 entries, which was way too many to actually be featured in the exhibit. Um, it got shortened down to about 72, but I want to say that like probably more than 72 women or events actually made it in, especially with the timeline. That's kind of one of the first cases um, that you come to. So what were the guiding concerns um, from our exhibit? So one of the main things that we wanted to do was balancing famous with lesser known women from history. So I think one of the most famous women, one of the most touted women in NC State's history is Katherine Stenson. And for good reason, she did a whole lot of stuff. She was one of the earliest um, women to graduate with an engineering degree. Um, she has, you know, the longest road on campus named after her. So she's someone that I think NC State has really recognized as accomplishments. But we also have people who are not as well known in the archives. Um, the Andrews sisters um, were one of my favorite collections to kind of go through. They basically just donated a bunch of their notes from having been here in the 1920s. Um, and I think that it really shows that like, some things have changed, but other things haven't. So I have one of their um, notes on the next slide that I'll kind of point that out because um, it always makes me laugh and it's one of my favorite things like from the exhibit. Um, another concern was like what defines womanhood and like what does it mean to be a woman because there's no single definition of it. Um, and then I think that gender was also a really complicated question here because um, of the comp because of the history of like gender and gender um, not being recognized as like different from, different from sex in the past. Like there's maybe some women who wouldn't have necessarily defined themselves as women that we're featuring. Um, and then there are people today that um, might not define themselves as women, but can relate to a lot of these themes. So I really wanted to recognize that individuality and intersectionality were really important for every single woman in this exhibit. Everyone had their own individual experiences, and a lot of that rested on um, who they were, what other identities they held. So that might include things like race, status, class, um, all of those things, sexuality as well. Um, and those all went through to make their experiences unique. unique. Um, and then just also <laughs> really realizing that like gender is a construct and that like it has changed over time in terms of like what does womanhood look like and what does it mean even just at a societal level. Um, so some of these photos that are over here I think kind of point to that. Um, they don't mind being the only girl in class was a technician article talking about women um, at NC State and classes. Um, and whether or not they like actually enjoyed being in classes, whether they didn't, a lot of them were like, yeah, you know, boys really, boys went to high school with girls. So like they kind of, you know, don't mind being around or like weird around girls. Um, but also there's the part of portion of like calling them girls, even though they're women and like adult women. Um, and then the Women Hunger for Justice is a fast that one of our NC State alumna um, participated in alongside Sonia Johnson, who's like a major feminist icon. Um, this is specifically advocating for the ERA. And then in the bottom right um, is a photo of Margaret Hunt, who was one of the first Black female um, employees of the libraries. And so I think that all of these photos just kind of show how there's a lot of different things that go into like what is being a woman. Um, and then silences in the archives was a major guiding concern, but I'm not gonna talk on that too much because that's gonna be what Virginia gets to um, as soon as I finish up my last slide here. Um, so this last, the main themes were really um, continuity and change is kind of one of the things that I picked up on a lot. So what has stayed the same and what has not in the lives of wolf pack women. Um, this photo in the upper left or upper right corner um, is the note that I was talking about from the Andrews sisters. It says, what time is it? Miss Brummett is 58 minutes late. And it was clearly a note that was kind of passed to another uh, classmate, which I think is hilarious because it's definitely something that like, you know, I think students today still have that, oh, like our professor hasn't gotten here in 15 minutes. Does that mean that we can leave? Um, sorry if any of my professors are watching. I promise we don't actually say that. Um, but you have things like call slips um, as well that's pictured on the bottom left there um, that really show how there are things that like have stayed really the same in um, 
students' lives. I think that student organizations and student life in terms of daily activities is also another area where there's a lot of opportunity for women to connect across generations. Um, something that has changed though is the larger context of women's lives and like how difficult it is for women to be on this campus. Um, so in the upper left, you have a, a letter to Dean Fainham um, in the engineering department from female faculty and staff that are basically saying there is not enough women's restrooms, even though there are way more men's restrooms and basically requesting to have um, equal access to you know, lavatories, which is something that women shouldn't have to ask for. Um, and yet people did in the past. And that's something that, you know, now I don't have to do that as a woman on campus, but um, recognizing that other people did. And then in the lower right is uh, one of my least favorite, but also most favorite um, artifacts from the exhibit. It's an FAA magazine that was in the Catherine Stenson collection. Um, and that photo of the woman there, um, she's basically called office decor. And what you don't see is that, on because I couldn't fit on the screen, is that in the lower part, um, there's another man who's highlighted and he's like in a suit standing in front of a plane. It's like talking about his accomplishments. Um, and so even though this woman was not from NC State, this is kind of the, the world that some of our alumna were like going into um, once they graduated as well. And so I think that, you know, obviously sexism is still a problem um, that we deal with today, but kind of this blatant like calling women decor is something that like I don't think would necessarily hopefully fly um, today. And then I lied about this being my last slide. Um, but uh, the second theme that we really focused on was it being a community of Wolfpack women. So one of the really cool things in the archives is seeing that women at NC State like really knew each other like for a long time. So again, student organizations were part of that knowing people on campus. Um, where the upper left is the Angel Flight scrapbook that's actually on display in the exhibit. Um, Angel Flight was just an organization of students that was like uh, supporting the Air Force ROTC here. So it's really cool and interesting. There's a big little bio on them. So definitely go check that out. Um, but others include um, a picture of Katherine Stinson and Frances Richardson, who is another important female professor. Um, that's in the lower left. Um, and then also a letter from Kay Yao to Katherine Stinson, inviting her to guest coach a women's basketball game. And so all of these women, Frances Richardson, Kay Yao, um, Katherine Stinson, they're all people who are um, mentioned in our exhibit. And so I just found it so interesting that I would find these connections um, across time. And Katherine Stinson, I think she was like in her 70s when Kay Yao invited her back. She might have been, she might have been younger than that or older than that. Don't quote me on that age exactly. But um, the fact that women really stayed connected um, later on. And then even before they got to NC State, so the the bottom right, the larger letter is a letter from Gertrude Cox. Um, to Pat Barber, who was a inter uh, student interested in coming to NC State and being in statistics, but was concerned about being a woman in the field. Um, and so Cox is kind of offering her support um, to her and like offering materials and, you know, her own personal experiences. And so I just found those connections and interpersonal um, relationships to be really important and a theme that showed up continuously throughout search uh, researching this exhibit. Um, and then the last slide, I promise that this one's actually the last one, um, is just some of the women that are featured in this exhibit, just kind of a little highlight um, for you all. Um, so starting on the top row, we have Susan Dutter, our, form, our first female director of libraries, who I think a lot of people in the audience probably know. Um, we have Nora Lynn Finch and Kay Yao, who are major um, important people in athletics. Jackie Gonzalez, who is our first Latinx um, student body president. Bottom row, Katherine Stenson, um, I already talked about her a lot. Marianne Fox, who was our, um, our first female chancellor. Justina Williams, who was one of the earliest black faculty members. And then Ashley Christensen, who's a major noted chef and whose food I personally love, um, who kind of represents alumna today. So there's a lot of women that are like this. Oh, and then Mary Evelyn Porterfield in the biggest um, photo, which is one of my favorite photos from the entire exhibit. She was the first black Miss Wolfpack. Um, 
and she just has like an amazing photo shoot, but that's one of my favorites. So these are the range of women that like are represented in um, the exhibit. There's definitely, this is definitely not all of them. So again, um, go and check it out if you have the time um, and to read through or even just look at the photos because there are some really cool ones that we were able to pull and some really awesome artifacts as well. So that's kind of my overview on where the exhibit um, process, how the exhibit process kind of went, what kind of women are um, featured. And hopefully if you guys have questions on any of that, you can pop them in the chat. But for now, I'll turn it over to Virginia. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so I'm here to talk about what we refer to in our field as silences in the archives. Um, one of the great challenges in working with this kind of material as a researcher um, and some of the ways that myself and other folks that I work with in special collections here um, help researchers like Kelly in navigating and questioning these silences um, and also how we as archivists um, are working to identify and repair and try to prevent future silences um, as much as that's possible um, from continuing in collections like what we have here at NC State. So I'll get into what all of this really means in a moment, but um, first I want to just congratulate Kelly and Henry for a really incredible exhibit. Um, it's a huge undertaking to do this kind of research um, on the scale that Kelly has done and pull it all together, and it's really beautiful and um, impressive. So I'm, I'm excited for the world to see it. Um, and I also want to share some credit with my colleagues in Special Collections who join me in this work um, of navigating the silences and archives and supporting researchers and students in the classroom, um, especially Todd Kosmerick, the university archivist, who's really involved with um, supporting the research that Kelly was doing. And um, also Victor Betts, our student success librarian in special collections, who um, kind of leads a lot of our teaching with me, um, as well as our special collections librarians, uh, Taylor Wolford and Philip McDonald. Many other folks are involved with this, but um, I just want to kind of in in, um, intentionally name them. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And I just want to kind of start um, with this quote from, uh, it's a proverb um, that was shared with me originally uh, about eight years ago through Tony Harris Thorpe, um, known by many at NC State uh, as Mama Thorpe, who was the former program coordinator for the African American Cultural Center for about 15 years. Um, much loved, still an incredibly important uh, member of the campus community, um, even though she no longer is here in a professional capacity. Um, but she often shared this quote, until the lion has its own historian, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So just kind of taking that in and thinking about it. Um, this is a quote she would often share with students to encourage them to think about whose stories are remembered and told and recorded as part of history and how power um, influences those stories, whose, whose stories are told, whose stories are remembered. Um, and with kind of our goal in special collections, she was also encouraging students to really consider themselves as agents of history and be proactive in creating and sharing their stories um, as members and, and creators of a larger campus history, a regional history, a national and a global history, um, and thinking about how we make that remembered, recording it and making it known. Um, so we can go into the next slide. Um, just briefly touching on, um, you can click it again, I think it dissolves. There we go. <laughs> um, briefly touching on defining what archives are. Um, this is sort of borrowing from the Society of American Archivists official definition um, that archives are records in a collection of, of materials of historical interest that have some kind of continuing value for researchers going into future generations and give documentary evidence of the past. So these can be all kinds of different formats of documents and media. Um, we think of them as kind of the raw materials of history, bits of information, um, ephemera, documents created over the course of people's everyday lives and the work of individuals, communities, organizations, institutions that are saved over however many years until someone decides to um, approach an institution that can archive them, preserve them, 
indefinitely and provide access to them for researchers. So many things have to happen in order for um, an archivist to, or for, in order for a collection to become part of an archives and then find its way to a researcher and then have those materials be interpreted and told in a story like what Kelly and Henry have put together. Um, so going on to the next slide, um, why do we archive things? Briefly, kind of some key reasons that we do this to remember, interpret, understand history, um, to strengthen our collective memory so we have a shared sense of our history and how we understand and remember the past, um, and to protect people's rights and property and identity. Um, archives are powerful in that they, they provide evidence of existence, and there are many kind of ways to think about this, but um, having a, a written record or a document of some kind um, really uh, gives a lot of um, uh, kind of validity and credibility to, to someone's story in their past. So on to the next slide. Um, touched a bit on what archives are, and now we can talk about what they are not. Um, archives are not any of these things here. They're not neutral, transparent, simple, or comprehensive. Um, archives are born out of inequitable systems of power, um, race, gender, other intersectional layers of privilege and oppression. Um, these are all factors that shape what, what kinds of materials make their way into archives and how researchers can navigate and understand them. Um, so there's many ways that we can talk about this as something that my colleagues and I think about, talk about, and sort of consider in the way we work every day. Um, but it's, it's a really important thing to kind of acknowledge um, when we're considering how we understand the past. Um, so the next slide, um, this is the official definition of an archival silence from, again, the Society of American Archivists, um, a gap in the historical record resulting from the unintentional or purposeful absence or distortion of documentation. Um, so this is one of the unfortunate realities we encounter in archives, um, where we may not be able to find sources that help us answer the questions that we're asking as researchers today. Um, those records may not exist. Um, an, an event that happened or a person who was here may not have created a record of their experience. Um, unfortunately, that would tell us about their time here at NC State. Um, or if they did make some kind of record, that those materials may not have made their way to an archive. Um, the person may have boxes of stuff that they kept in their home, but um, they didn't think that they were important enough to bring to the university to offer to the archives. Or um, someone just cleaned out the closet and tossed it all, which breaks our hearts always as archivists and we hear things like that. Um, but in the most unfortunate of cases, sometimes someone may have offered materials to an archive um, and because of lots of different factors of kind of inequity in our society, um, an institution may have said no because they didn't see those materials as historically valuable. So these are all kind of challenges and realities that we're dealing with today. Um, and it's something that researchers will encounter and especially when researching historical firsts and the stories of people and communities that have been historically marginalized um, as Kelly encountered while curating this exhibit and doing all of her research into um, women at NC State. Um, so on to the next slide. Um, these are some of the questions that we uh, kind of foreground when we're working with researchers, when we're teaching with archive archives in the classroom um, to understand the silences that will be there. Um, who created the records that we are able to work with? How did those records end up in an archives? Um, whose voices are there? Whose voices are not Who's, who are we not seeing or hearing? Um, and what does this tell us today? Because those, those absences, those silences um, are information in themselves. That's data that we can um, kind of talk about and work with. Um, and then lastly, how can we address these silences? Um, not only what do they tell us, but how can we um, kind of think about other materials and records that might help answer some of those questions? Or how can we actively um, kind of uh, find material that may exist, people who may have archives or may be able to tell us verbally in an oral history um, stories that could, could fill in those silences? Um, so the next slide. Um, 
a familiar name that Kelly mentioned several times, Catherine Stinson, um, is one example of this. So Catherine Stinson, as Kelly mentioned, was um, she was the first woman to enroll in the School of Engineering here at NC State. She came in 1937, um, or she enrolled in 1937 graduated in 1941 um, with a degree in aeronautical engineering inspired by this photograph where she met Amelia Earhart told her she wanted to be a pilot and Earhart um, encouraged her to study engineering instead um, to kind of have a more lasting impact on the field. Um, so there are um, there's a, an amazing collection of materials that Catherine donated to the archives in the 1990s. That's um, ex an extremely um, rich, fascinating kind of gift to have that, um, showing a lot of her achievements in her career and her continuing efforts throughout her career to recruit more women and underrepresented minorities into the field of engineering. Um, but of her time at NC State, there's not a ton of, of material. Um, there's just not a lot of documents either in her collection or in other um, university archives um, showing what she was doing, what she was experiencing, thinking what, you know, what was it like for her on campus as a student. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can use to kind of understand her um, after she left NC State, but in, in terms of on the ground as a student, um, there's not a lot. Um, but going on to the next slide, um, as part of this material that she donated, um, fortunately, she also sat down for several oral history interviews in the 1990s and, and mostly 80s and 90s. Um, so there's one in particular where she tells the story um, of when she first arrived at NC State to enroll in the School of Engineering. Um, and the dean at the time, Dean Riddick, um, turned her away because she was a woman. And um, her quote here says that he, he told her, you know, what are you doing here, little girl? And he said, girls don't go to school here. Girls don't study engineering. Um, so he told her that she could apply. She could return to apply to, to enroll in the School of Engineering here only if she were to transfer from another college with junior level credits. Um, and I think that was probably an attempt to kind of turn her away, but she was not um, deterred by that. So she, she went to Meredith College and completed two years worth of academic credits in one year um, and returned to um, fulfill that promise. And um, so she, uh, at the time was one of few female students at the university and the only female student in the engineering program, graduated in 1941 and um, went on to have a really uh, long and influential career in um, the FAA. So this oral history is a really important um, example of how we can sort of re repair or address the silences that exist um, where there's no written record of that moment that um, reality of her experience as a, a woman coming to NC State to try to enroll in engineering. There's no written record of that, but she's able to tell us in her own words in this oral history. Um, so those are one, that's one of the kind of approaches that we think about when we're, we're addressing silences now. Um, then on to the next slide. Um, this is another person Kelly mentioned, Justina Williams, who we often talk about when we're talking about silences. Um, Justina Williams was the first African-American academic staff member at NC State, as Kelly mentioned, um, beginning her work here at NC State in the 1950s and continuing on through at least the 80s, I think into the 90s, um, a very long career here, working as a research technician in the genetics department. And um, you would imagine over 40 plus years um, being on campus in that research environment, um, incredibly important, influential in her contributions to a lot of work that was happening um, by researchers, graduate students, faculty in genetics here. Um, but looking at the records that exist, there is only one, maybe two mentions of her in lists of staff as part of the department. Um, nothing else that represents who she was, what she was doing, and the impact she made. Um, so this is an example of kind of showing she was here, she was doing incredible things um, that we can only kind of imagine, um, but there are no records representing her voice um, or um, her experience. So 
there are many layers of how this kind of um, can be understood on campus and in our university archives. Um, a lot of the way we work with this is to kind of uh, try to examine the other records that can fill in some of those gaps for us. Um, but just recognizing that um, there are people on campus today who remember her, who worked with her, who are able to share some of their memories with us and her family have been able to talk to us and kind of share more about her um, to, to kind of uh, tell us more about her life and the ways that she um, was part of the community here. Um, so on to the next slide. This is a, a quote from uh, an archivist, Kate Thimer, who um, says that archivists must be actively engaged in trying to ensure that no new silences are created in archives. And where silences do exist, um, we need to help researchers find the voices that survived to fill the void. So kind of talking about how we approach working with researchers and students um, is really building on this idea. Um, so on the next slide, this is just a quick kind of couple of images of some of the outreach that we've done in the past eight to 10 years, um, working with different alumni events and organizations, um, kind of letting people know that we are here because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, someone might have material in their closet that um, would be incredibly uh, enriching to have in the archives, but they may not know that we're here, that we may, that we would want that, that we are here to talk to them about those materials. Um, so especially targeting um, historically underrepresented student communities and alumni communities um, to share their stories and to tell us their um, memories and um, consider what they may have to help fill in some of the silences that exist. Um, the next slide, just again, touching on oral history as a really powerful tool in filling some of those gaps and silences, um, especially for historically marginalized uh, communities and people who are not reflected in a lot of the institutional records of, of uh, the university, um, including a lot of women who were firsts um, of different kinds. And uh, next slide, the Wolf Tales program is something that has been um, kind of evolving over the last six, six years or so, I guess. Um, to collect more stories of the NC State community. Um, that includes students, faculty, staff, alumni, um, past and present. So um, you can check out the link here, um, the Go link that takes you to kind of the homepage. Um, but, uh, and the next slide gives also a contact email address just to think about um, those of you who are watching this and considering um, maybe parts of this university's history that you have experienced and, and stories that you believe should be known and remembered, um, that you can actively kind of help us fill those gaps by reaching out to the email address here, going to the website there. Um, we have a virtual submission platform. We're also happy to talk to you about ways that you can record in other formats um, to share with us to add to this collection um, as a way of, of really kind of making sure that the silences that do exist in our, our archives, um, we're doing everything we can to make sure everyone who wants to be part of that history can be going forward. Um, so next slide um, is just kind of wrapping it up to think about how um, we want to interrogate these silences to tell new stories the way that Kelly has done um, in the research that she uh, very impressively carried out for this um, exhibit, um, looking at some of the questions that come up when we see um, the records that are there um, and considering what what is not there. How do we um, weave some kind of new um, interpretation of, of um, what we know and what we don't know? So uh, I'll wrap it up there. I, I could talk about this all day and I do encourage anyone who has questions to put them in the chat and um, or reach out to the email address for Wolf Tales um, or myself. But I will hand it off to Henry now. Awesome, thank you. Um, I did a lot of the design for this. So that was sort of bringing together the research that Kelly had done. Um, and the copy that the external relations team helped write. And um, I have to also give credit to um, Chuck Samuels, who's my boss and also has been like a mentor for me through this whole 
process. So, next slide. So first thing was doing some research into what other people are doing to talk about women. Um, so my biggest piece of inspiration was the Beyond Curie exhibit, which is at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences right now. Um, it has a lot of similar like older pictures of women that they've added lots of color to. So I wanted to really incorporate that into my designs. And then the other big exhibit that I saw um, when doing research was this If Then exhibit or If Then She Can. Um, it's the largest collection of statues of women. It's 125 3D printed statues of different women. Um, they have just very simple information about them, just like their name and like in a sentence or two, their accomplishments. And the point of it is to really encourage um, girls and women to see like the breadth of what women can do and what they've accomplished. Um, so I think that was just sort of important to see and think about um, in making our exhibit, the purpose sort of being not necessarily focusing in on these women that people already have heard about, but making sure that we're covering a wide variety of women to try and represent the diversity on campus and make sure that people are aware of just like all of the different things that people have accomplished, but also giving them uh, that supplemental web com content if you want to go do more research on uh, women. So linking back to other articles that people have written, linking to the archives website um, for Special Collections Resource Center, you can go on and look through a lot of the scanned documents. It's really cool. Next slide. Um, so these were some of my early concepts. They're not very good. They look very textbooky, um, but that was kind of where I started. So um, on the next slide, you can see kind of how that developed, um, get a little bit more fun, starting to move towards some of these more round um, designs. And all of the text here is just like filler text. We had a couple of women that we knew we were going to include. So I just took their names, found like the longest name I could find, make sure that I can fit that in the text in the fonts that I'm testing out. Um, so this was just sort of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what would stick. Um, so after this, on the next slide, I started developing the color scheme. So started out with sort of these colors and Kelly actually went to an exhibit in Philadelphia at the um, Constitution Center that had some really cool colors. So that was um, a lot of these colors sort of came from being inspired by that too. But we started with like NC State Red and then I added in these other colors. Um, and then from there on the next slide, um, we added in some more of these. So we added in the uh, purple for Susan Nutter specifically because that was her favorite color. And again, she was the first female director of the library. So she's very important to us as a library's exhibit group. Um, but also a really important thing with the color scheme for me was making sure that pink was like prominent in the color scheme because a lot of the research I was doing, a lot of the way that women are talked about uh, recently in exhibits, it's mostly focusing on women in STEM. And all of the exhibits that I was seeing, all of the graphics I was seeing, they were completely like blue and green and that is it. We will not be pink, we will not do any of that. And that was just really sad to me. I think like, not that all women should be forced to be lumped into like this liking pink idea, but I think that women should be allowed to like pink women should be allowed to be feminine and that shouldn't detract from their like accomplishments that they're smart those things are not contradictory so i wanted to make sure that we were including what in our culture is defined as like stereotypically feminine colors making sure that we're including that with women's accomplishments because women can be all sorts of things so we wanted to reflect that diversity in our colors um, the next slide So from there, we kind of started laying out in the exhibit space where we wanted things to go. So this was really uh, Kelly telling us where there were artifacts that we could put, what content that she was finding in the archives. So we worked together to figure out where we wanted things to go. And then I started thinking about um, how those things would fit in the cases. So from there, we could kind of really get into the layout design. So on the next slide, you'll see um, where that kind of starts. So it's really just once Kelly had figured out um, which women she wanted to feature, which pictures were really important, all of that, started just sort of throwing them in there um, on these panel sizes and seeing what happened. So there's still a lot of empty space in these designs. You see a lot of 
empty boxes where I was hoping pictures would go as we were finding them. Um, but just sort of getting that layout started. Um, and on the next slide, kind of see, um, we were finding a lot of black and white pictures. So most of these are pictures of uh, Kathy Sterling, who was a really influential student leader. Um, and they were cool, but also we were having really bright and colorful backgrounds and stuff. So the black and white pictures weren't necessarily fitting in the best. So on the next slide, you can see how we started to um, cut pieces out of the images, pop in a lot of color in there so that it would just pop a little bit more and be a little more eye-catching, not feel like these things were really old because sometimes I think that's the association with black and white these days. Um, but that's a lot of the pictures in the archives. So we just added some color to get it to be a little more eye-catching. Um, and on the next slide, talking about the artifacts. So we have a bunch of artifacts in this exhibit. Most of them are scanned in just so that they can stay in the archives and stay safe because a lot of them are more fragile. And this also allows us to resize them if they're scanned in, because it's just a very nice picture. So if it's hard to read, we can scale it up. If it's a huge artifact that wouldn't even fit in the cases, we can have a nice scan and put them in there. Um, but we do have some real artifacts too that Special Collections was nice enough to let us display. One really cool one, um, we have Gertrude Cox's eyeglasses. Um, it's just really cool to see them. They they look really different than today's glasses. And I don't know, it's it's just an interesting like everyday object that she would have used. Um, but we have a lot of other objects in there and I really recommend that you go check them out because it, it's really neat to see them. Um, so the next slide, I'm kind of taking you through the development of two cases. So this was kind of, again, that early stage where I was just putting in the names of um, women that Kelly wanted to feature and that uh, putting in the images that I had so far. And then the next slide, um, we kind of, we, we had established the word counts that we wanted for people. So um, just in writing the bios, we needed a general word count to have um, a general idea of what the layout would be. And the external relations team helped a lot with writing the copy and Kelly as well um, from the research that she'd done. So all of that was coming from them. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see as that copy got in, um, I was able to really figure out how the layout would actually look, um, being able to size all those things in. And then um, also bringing in the images that Kelly was finding. She gave me like, basically a big menu of like, here are all the, the coolest images that I found in the archives. Um, and again, she was really a driving force in making sure that like, we want to represent the diversity of women, we want to represent like intersectional identities, we want to make sure that women of color are being well represented. So that was something that I tried to keep in mind, as I was going through the options of images, to make sure that I was selecting a good variety of women, making sure I was finding like women who look different from each other, making sure it wasn't all just white faces across the board when you're looking at it. Um, and again, because of the silences in the archive, sometimes that meant um, including more pictures of like unidentified students, just because that's what we where we have records of diversity. Um, but I think. I think in the end, we were able to represent pretty diverse women. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think that is still something to be conscious of as you look at these designs. Um, and on the next slide, the, that should be the, yes, where the um, designs are finalized. So this is what you'll see in the cases when you go in and look. Um, and the next slide will show them in the cases. They're up now. Um, and I'm really happy with how they look. I, I think it's a really cool exhibit. And I, yeah, I, I'm just really happy with how it turned out. I think there's a lot of great information in there and we definitely couldn't cover it all. There are so many women featured. Um, it was sometimes tough to fit everything in the case that we wanted to. Um, there's, there's so much in the archives that like we just couldn't include. Um, and yeah, you just gotta go check it out. So the next slide has a, picture of the bigger gallery but again you really got to be there in person and just read the content because there are some great stories in there and some really great artifacts to look at 
So I really recommend if you have the time, come by any time that the library is open, you can come check out the exhibit. And thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have some time for, or, and on that note, Marion is gonna drop the um, times that DHL is open in the chat. So um, just check that out and you can come during those times to see the exhibit. Um, and now I'd like to open it up for uh, Q&A. If you'd like, you can put your question in the chat and we'll, we'll ask it and then Henry, Virginia and Kelly can answer. I can go ahead and start, and I guess I'm just gonna, to all three, to Kelly and um, Henry, when you guys started to think about the exhibit, I'm sure you had an idea of what like women you'd cover and what stories, was there anything that surprised you while you were doing your research? Um, yeah, I mean, there were definitely a lot of things that I think were, um, really surprising I think that like I'm trying to think of like what were some of the moments where I was really like wow I like wouldn't have expected that um I think that a lot of those unfortunately are just moments where like I kind of had to get up and like walk away because I didn't really realize like how um tough it was for women in the past um so especially I mean the FAA after hours article where the woman is like you know, described as decor. I was like, ah, like I really had to take a minute after that one. Um, I think the bathrooms were like really hard to deal with. And then like some of the instances of racism that like black women specifically have dealt with, like at NC State. Um, I think that it's 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 upsetting because it wasn't necessarily surprising, um, but it was, you know, disappointing. Um, but I think also like there were fun sides and fun surprises too. Um, one of my favorite artifacts that is in the cases um, is like seven up cans that are dedicated to Kay Yao, um, which is just a super weird, like fun artifact like to have on display. Um, it's in the athletics case if anybody goes by and looks at it. Uh, definitely try to get down at eye level so you can like see her name written on it. Um, so I think that there were there were these moments of like sadness um, and surprise that just how difficult it was, but then there were also a lot of moments of joy um, and finding these really cool, interesting artifacts um, that really showed like that, you know, there was a lot of vibrancy to like being a woman at NC State too. I think mm -hmm. one of the- uh, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Henry, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're good. Um, I, think, I think it was surprising to just to know like where find where the silences were like there were some women that we were covering that they were like so important to the university and we just didn't have a picture of them and it's like how did they not like get a picture of this woman like she is so cool she's doing all of this and we don't have a picture of her anywhere that's wild and I think it just shows how important it is to like really be intentional about recording that history Definitely. Um, so this question came in for Henry, and it is, where is the if then she can exhibit? So that exhibit has been moving around, actually. I think it's currently in Austin, Texas, um, somewhere, but I'm not entirely sure. I know it was at a Smithsonian Institute at one point, but I believe it is moving around the country. So um, if you look it up online, you can probably find where it is now. Um, we're getting a couple of people have commented on Carolyn Jessup, and I, I guess I just want to ask, is, is she, is she featured or is she mentioned in the exhibit? Is there information about her? Um, she definitely is featured in the exhibit. I just had a complete brain, brain blank on, um, what exactly, what first she did. So Virginia, you know, and you like can pop in, but if not, that's okay. That's on me. Um, yeah, there are so many women, but I do remember her name popping up um, and I'm almost certain that she's featured in the exhibit. If she's not though, do, do you know who, what her 
Ursula. Yes, so so the comment um, actually gives a lot of information. Jerry Barker says um, she was the first dean of women. That's sort of what she's known for, but many other things, including first female director of student health and, and lots of other things. So um, and Marion confirmed that she is in the exhibit. Um, there's a photo of her um, and also included a link to in our digitized collections. There are some really great photographs of her, lots of mentions in the technician newspaper and other kind of university archives. So she is definitely represented in the archives and there are a lot of things that you know could be you know said about her i'm sure um but yeah that's the kind of example where um uh, when uh you know jerry or others who knew her remembered her um we would love to hear what you remember about her to kind of fill in some of what's in those written records because you know i'm sure there's a lot of great stuff because there's like 89 results in our digitized materials, um, which is incredible. But um, the story that you may have about her uh, probably is not in those technician articles. So that's where um, connecting with us, reaching out to me or the Wolf Tales email or um, checking out the Wolf Tales website, recording a story and submitting it. Um, that's where you can really contribute um, and consider if you have other kind of documents and materials that you might want to to share with us um so yeah it's great I, I feel like i learn new things every day that i'm working in this campus about um, the people who are known and then people that we should know more about so yeah thank you for sharing that and thanks to anybody else who would like to and just to jump in on that um so now I do remember her. Yes, she is in the exhibit. Sorry, I was just like, there's so many women that, and I'm in the middle of finals. So I'm like a little bit like all over the place. Um, but also like adding on to that, um, if there are women that like, you know about that you don't see are featured or there's other information, there is a link to that um, at the end of the exhibit. It's in a little QR code um, that links to a form online. And it'll also be linked on the um, exhibit's website uh, where you can submit information about women and stories that may be featured um, on our social media. And then also we're hoping to turn those over um, to special collections as well so that they kind of have that record to, um, and hopefully if there's like another exhibit, you know, um, 50, 100 years from now, um, the next researcher will have another place to start um, to tell some more and different stories. So that is definitely in addition to like actually talking to the SCRC and doing um, the Special Collections Resource Center and like actually doing like oral histories and like recording those officially. But if you want an easy place to start, um, that form is a good place to do that. All right, we have one more question. Um, is there any kind of oral history component in your research? I'd love to hear some of their voices slash writings. Oh my gosh, yes, there's so much oral history. Um, I did a lot of I did a lot of listening to oral histories. Um, unfortunately, the case that I think is currently um still waiting, we're still waiting on like one single panel. So there's one case where the paper hasn't come down yet. Um, I think that that's the one where we have a lot of quotes about women's experiences, um, but sprinkled throughout, there's a lot of information about um, different women in the exhibit. Um, the breaking barrier or the bear, the yeah, breaking barriers case, um, which you can actually see pictured in this, um, it's the large case in the photo on the right. Um, it has a lot of recent alumna um, and women who I like found through um, through wolf tales and stuff like that too. So there are oral histories linked throughout with QR codes. So definitely take your phone, a pair of earbuds that you can go through and listen while you're also reading. There's some comfy chairs um, to sit down and like spend some time in the exhibit as well. So, um, but there are tons and tons and tons of oral histories that. Um, I know Virginia especially has like worked on and so they were a really big part of the research that I did um, on the exhibit. Thank you. Um, and we'll be sending a recording out of this program to all the attendees and in that email we can also include um, the email address of the Special Collections Research Center and, re and wolf, wolf Tales. So if you do have any stories or information you'd like to share you'll be able to get it from that email. Um, and I think that is the last of our questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Henry, Kelly, and Virginia for an amazing program. I haven't seen the exhibit yet, and I'm very excited to walk by and look at it. And we hope that, that you guys are able to as well. Um, and, like, and just check the chat for the hours for the exhibit. And um, 
In addition to that, we are planning on doing more campus, here, campus history series programs in the spring. So more information will be coming out about that after the holiday. Um, thank you again for attending this program and I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. Thank you.